Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where we discuss what's happened in the week of the world of professional cycling and look ahead what's going to happen as well. And as always, I'm joined by Patrick Blake of Audu Cycling and Mr. Gregor himself, Ewan Wilson. And I mean, guys, there's a huge agenda. It seems like even though the Tour de France is long gone, we still have a hectic program. Tour of Britain, obviously, the three of us big fans, well, connection to Britain, whatever. The Quebec race or Quebec and Montreal and the Vuelta España as well. And I mean, um, yeah, we might as well. Vuelta España. Uh, what have you thought of the second week? Um, Sepp Kuss still in the red jersey. I think none of us said Sepp Kuss was going to be in the red jersey last week. But I, yeah. I think I, 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 Did you? I, Oh, okay. My apologies. I might, have done. I might just claim it anyway. And just <laughs> And do you know what? If people want to prove me wrong, you have to go back and watch last week's episode to try and prove me wrong. There you go. I think it's been a decent week. I mean we had that Tormelay stage, which was like literally the most dominant mountain performance ever by any team, in my opinion, that I've ever watched. You know, there were probably ones way back in the day, um, which were probably of equal caliber, but that was insane. We've had a few more kind of breakaway victories, which the Vuelta has always been kind of known for, but it's kind of, they're, they're finally starting to come in. It felt like we didn't really have, like, any in the first week, and there was, like, one or two, like, Kemners, I think, unless that wasn't, I, I can't remember. But yeah, it kind of feels like the Vuelta, I don't know, Right now, it kind of feels like it's already set in stone, kind of what's going to happen, which kind of reduces the excitement of it a little bit for me. The thing that does make it exciting is now that Remco's down on GC, which, you know, if, if you didn't know that already, that's on you. Like, this isn't a spoiler alert. <laughs> but yeah, the Rem- Remco going in breakaways is making it exciting. Um, but yeah, Jumbo just have a stranglehold on it. And yeah, so the GC game's a little bit over, but it's still interesting in the voice. The Vuelta is always so like, fascinating because it's such a unique Grand Tour. Like it operates in its own world a lot of the time. And I feel like this one has happened once again. It was a really exciting opening week. And now after that, that, that Tourmalet stage, I feel like we now kind of understand what, where the race is going to go going forward. It's still interesting in a way because we have no idea how the Umber Visma dynamic is going to play out. Like, is Sepkus legitimately going to win this Vuelta? Uh, is Roglic going to come through? Is Vingegaard going to ping out on a mountain stage and gain a minute on all the other guys? It is really hard to tell. There probably will be a Jumbo Visma winner in one week's time. There will be the thumbnail of episode 34. But which one? It it, it it does make it super wide open. And the fact that Kuss is there, I don't think we've had that before where, like, a domestique has been in this position where... They're such an unseasoned GC rider, but they also have their GC leader just below them in the classification. Maybe Garrett Thomas in 2018 Tour de France, we had similar sort of discourse about like, could he legitimately go all the way? Or is he just sort of a dummy for Chris Froome, who at that point had won four Tours de France before that? So it definitely makes a fascinating uh, fascinating racing. But yeah, the Vuelta's weltering. Who is going to win it? So are we literally, well, we said this last week as well, but we might as well continue it. It's the rest day that this is coming out. Because, like, you can make the case that Kuss might win it because he's helped Roglic, he's helped Jonas win there, and this is kind of their gift to him. But equally, Roglic wants the fourth one. Vingegaard wants the Tor Welta. So, like, each narrative has its own kind of merit to it. Yeah, I don't know. Has anybody got a three-sided coin? Does that exist i don't know because like you say scott each one of them's got its own upside i guess sep in a way winning it in my eyes makes the most sense because Jonas has won the tour Roglic has won the giro so therefore cuss winning the vuelta is just like another bragging right for yumbo to kind of parade around in front of uae more than above all else i think that cuss makes the most sense but I could also see a scenario where Roglic has could win it, but I don't know. Roglic, like on Tormley, I know that he finished third, but he was like jersey unzipped. He just hasn't looked quite the same in the second week as he did in the first week. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe that's just me just making things up. But I think that either one of them could could do it. But from a narrative perspective, I think Seps makes kind of the most sense also he's a big fan favorite as well so that helps too not that Roglic having a guard aunt I'm just saying that Sep has a big big fan base also a big American market as well to be tapped think about all those I mean putting a business perspective like business hat on think about all those Yumbo Visma jerseys that could be shipped to the US think about how big 
uh, the exposure will be in America that they have a Grand Tour champion, their first Grand Tour champion since problematic days. So that could be really Chris Horner. Really Are you calling Chris Horner? Chris Horner problematic days. <laughs> Um, I forgot about Chris Horner. Maybe so. He, he's a, a YouTuber as, now, so you a popular YouTuber. He might respond to you. Chris Horner Chris, responds Chris, to you and Wilson. <laughs> That's because I forgot about Chris Horner. Please, Chris, don't cut me. Next week's um, clip. Nevertheless, <laughs> I want to be dragged by Chris Horner. That's that. That's the new aim of the game: is to be called a knucklehead by by Christopher Horner, 2013 World Tour Spaniard champion. Your point is good, though, because. You highlighted the fact that after the Giro, they had that merchandise that they had prepared. So yeah, obviously having that shipped to Colorado to wherever in the US, yeah, would be very Yomba Visma. And also the fact that they would have three Grand Tours won by three different people, that is like the form of dominance. And it's probably going to be a full podium of all three of them. In Madrid. Can you think of any team that's actually done anything close to this? Ineos or Sky was 1-2 with Bradley and Froome, obviously. 1-3 with Geraint and Froome. I can't recall ever seeing a 1-2-3 on any... I mean, I'm probably someone in the comments will remind us if following cycling for a longer time. But in terms of what I can remember, this has never happened. Even a team winning all three Grand Tours. Obviously, we had Chris Froome winning 2017 the tour welter and then the giro but in the same calendar year that's like crazy it is insane i can't remember i remember seeing a statistic on it that i don't think any team has done it in recent times but teams have come close-ish where they've maybe won two and then come third in another um movistar kind of over the last kind of like decade or so have been very consistent in the grand tours especially in kind of the nairo valverde era that was quite a, a good combo which they had there but i don't think any teams come close to this kind of yumbo visma dominance and i feel like aside from like an ayuso attack why would yumbo visma have any desire to set a pace that is too hard for sepkus i mean not that there is because obviously he like he did better than roglic so I don't get why Yumba Visma would want to try and remove Sepkus from GC lead, other than, I don't know, just sheer spiciness in the media <laughs> or something. Just like if they've got a new documentary coming out, they needed a kind of a, a cool, spicy chapter. But I think it's going to be hard for anyone to dethrone Sep because it's going to require, I don't know who, to basically try and remove him from that and I just don't see who's going to do that I just think it'll be really cool to have Chris as a winner because when have we ever had a winner like that before like someone completely like it's like if I don't know, Wout Pauls won the 2017 Bota Espana after all this work for Chris Froome it's such a nice way of it all happening and I think Rogo Chimengo will have another time where I feel like maybe because the stars are really aligned and he's got, he's done, ridden all three Grand Tours this year and he's been on the winning team for the Vizna every time they've won a Grand Tour uh, since their reboot. So it just makes sense. Spain is like his adopted home now. He speaks Spanish, loves this race. It's where he won his first Grand Tour stage. I think it'd be really nice for him to, to seal the deal in Madrid next week. Okay, we've spoken about who we want, the scenario, the dominance, et cetera, et cetera. But who do you think is going to be on the podium on that top step of the podium? Do you think it's going to be a clean wash? And I mean, Patrick, your stat now with is just depressing now with the Grand Tour podiums because, uh, yeah, Yombo is just wiping the floor with everyone. But who do you think is going to win? This is our mini rest day prediction again. I'm going Sap. I don't see a reason. I don't see a scenario where he fully cracks. I don't see why Yumba Visma would do anything to put his position in jeopardy. And they seem the only team capable of basically being able to remove Sep from that top step. Because I just don't see how UAE, unless they really combine around a Yuzo to set a pace that drops Kuss off of a podium and moves a Yuzo up. I just don't see how Sep loses it. And for that to happen, Kuss has to lose two and a half minutes. Like at this point, I'm I, I think Kuss as well. I think the only reason Kuss couldn't win is because of himself. Second place is gonna be Jonas and third place is gonna be Roglic. Jonas only wins if Kuss has an off day 
or if he needs to respond to something. But now they have that big two and a half minute buffer to Ayuso. Well, what are they responding to? Like, I think on Angleroo, it, it might get tough. I think Ayuso is going to do really well on Angleroo, but is he going to do better than the, than the Vinga go Roglic? I don't, really don't think so. Yeah, it's almost at the point of why are we tuning in for the third week here? Yeah, yeah but to be fair, we don't know how Kuss is going to go. So I think, but then Kuss was so good in the final week of the Giro. Kuss was strong in the final week of, of the Tour de France, even though he crashed. I think it'll still be an interesting race. Three Grand Tours this year as well. It's some feat by him. And top 20 in GC are all three. Not top 15, actually. Oh, well, well, there we go. The Giro. Yeah, 12th at the Tour. And I mean, he only cracked in the tour and yeah, because of a crash. And what was the Giro? Yeah, I mean, he was just kind of staying out of trouble until he was deployed. But yeah, it's some feat if he pulls this off. Going from one Yombo dust dominance to the next one, Tour of Britain. Did you guys watch this race? Olaf Koy kind of dominated the first, was it four stages he won all? And then the next stage, it was Wout van Aert. They bluffed the other sprinting trains and then, yeah, Uno X got a stage and then I didn't watch the last one where Carlos Rodriguez, who you questioned you and why he was here and he proved you wrong by finishing 10th overall <laughs> and winning a stage. Well, I mean, 10th overall for a guy who finished top five at the Tour de France, but fair play. I really didn't think the the, the hills of southern Wales would be would be where Carlos Rodriguez would take a medium level victory. But overall the race, I mean, state it's had a lot of slack this week because of poor route design, boring profiles, repetitive stages. And I think that's very fair for the first half of the race. Second half was more interesting, but with the lack of bonus seconds, I think that really just emphasize that second half of the race if you had bonus seconds throughout could have made it a hell of a lot more interesting but it was cool seeing Rasmus Tilla win a stage he's a guy who's delivered so much over the past couple of years and just missed that big win and Van Aert's victory was also equally just as impressive similarly Danny Van Poppel finally getting his own victory as well yeah I, I agree it was I I have seen comments saying that it is it has been a boring week of racing you know the first six stages or whatever but i also saw a very sensible point which is saying that while the alternative to having a, a rubbish tour of britain might have been no tour of britain at all and you know if that was the case then the race might not survive to do few traditions so maybe it's just you just have to take this rather naff addition and hopefully in the future um it gets built upon and maybe more interesting parkours come so that's kind of like the optimistic take on it i feel like it was yeah it i really want to try and you know sugarcoat it and make it better than it was but it was just like it was just a zlm tour with just like a couple of like hilly stages blotted on the end i haven't watched the final stage just yet i haven't had time today but yeah, if there were more stages like that, like the final stage, maybe just like three of them um, rather than just the one, maybe this could have been a more interesting race, especially if they were interspersed throughout the race. You know, two sprints, a, a, mount, a hilly stage, another sprint or two, another one, another one sprint, and then another hilly stage. You know, maybe that might be more interesting, maybe a TT in there or whatever, but, you know, there's so many kind of hypotheticals that could be put into Where this. was the time trial? Like, the UK huge time trial well, scene, no time trial. Yeah. Well, 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 well. When the Tour of Britain organizers tried to gaslight us into saying you should be thankful for having something, they said that a time because people were like, where's the time trial? They were like, oh, well, actually, time trials are the hardest ones to organize because you need a road, a continuous road closure for X amount of hours. And it's actually the hardest and the most expensive stages to run understandable but at the same time you could have it in a small area blah 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 maybe i'm just stupid but i don't know i just think the redesign is bad like it's just it's just poor it's unimaginative i've i've been in a tour of britain hate camp for a number of years and i i think it just continues there really needs to be more diversi diversification in places it goes i know that depends on the local councils but seriously there, there, there are places where you could really bring this race and make it into quite uh, the sort of 
the spectacle we saw in the Tour de Yorkshire a couple of years ago before that was axed, that, that fans are willing to go out there, throw it into rural west coast of Scotland. It would be phenomenal on, on television. The UK could be a really nice canvas for a bike race. It's just so un- like neglected when you have a flat stage rolling through Essex, when the day before it's a flat stage rolling through Suffolk next door. Snooze fest, I'm sorry. Completely fair, what you said. Yeah, yeah, no, completely. Like Yorkshire was hardly touched on. The Yorkshire Moors, the Yorkshire Dales, nothing. Scotland, like you said as well, we just had the World Championships there. I think ZLM Tour plus two stages or whatever is quite a good <laughs> good name for it. But anyways, what we were going to talk about before we just turned it into... I, I'm, I'm pretty sure British cycling don't like us, but the feeling's a bit mutual. Sort out your racing scene, guys. But in terms of Olaf Koy, does this add anything to him, this dominance we saw uh he was just well wiping the floor with with uh sam bennett he was there was world tour teams there it wasn't like he was up against continental teams so olaf koi is he still like this next superstar sprinting prodigy i don't think it adds too much to him to be honest with you just because he was like the sprinter in the race i I never sam bennett but let's face it this isn't like 2021 bennett um, you know, green jersey smashing. This is Sam Bennett, who has become a little bit lost in in his kind of sprinting prowess over the last year or so. And therefore, I didn't think that Coy's position as top sprinter was going to be particularly, you know, under threat, especially when he's being led out by Wout Van Aert and Affini and Van Hoydonk. Like, it was always going to be pretty inevitable that Coy was going to win multiple stages of this race. I think that four in a row, although surprising, seems a little bit inevitable in a way. If he didn't win, there'd be much less hype around him. So I guess that the fact that he does win doesn't de- detract anything from him. But I don't think that him winning against this caliber of field does much in terms of making me think that he is any better than he was before. I think for sprinters, World Tour victories mean so much. Like, if you're... And he's already won World Tour sprints. I don't really think the Tour of Britain adds anything, to be honest. I think the win he got in Paris, for instance, was more impressive and the ones in Tour of Poland in the past as well. I, I, I really don't think this steps him up a notch. He had a really strong train against Grandad Sam Bennett. Um, and... Ethan Vernon, who was writing for the national team. So, I mean, anyway, with Koi, you said it doesn't really add anything to him, but where does this put him in, like, the ranking of sprinters? If we say Jasper Philipson is the king, where does Koi go from this? That is... I don't know. I think it's a good question, because there, there have been comparisons this week between what would be better. Is it Van der Poel with Philipson, or is it Wout Van Aert? and Olav Koy. And I've seen that bashed around a couple of times this week with people debunking it, saying, well, you know, it's Tour of Britain, so it probably, you know, it's not that big of a deal versus Van der Poel and Philipson at Le Freak in Tour de France. <laughs> so I've, I still think that Philipson and Van der Poel have the edge, considering that we haven't seen Wout and, and Koy doing the this kind of thing in, a, in the big stage. So I'm still going to kind of wait on that. But I do think that Koi, like like I said last year, oh, not last year, last episode, I probably was probably saying it last year as well. He needs to go to a Grand Tour next year. We made a clip on it. I'd say that he is one of the fastest sprinters in the world, especially when you consider, like, is he on a similar level to Gronovagen or something who I'd consider to be top five? Like, yeah, I probably would say so. Yes, but Phillips are top tier, S tier. A tier would be Jakob's... Uh... Um, Malia? Yeah, I think Malia. You won a race this week as well. Yeah, he did. He just what about? Squeeps uh, up all these one day races. Pedersen? Wow. Um, hmm. Runnevagen? I would say Wow is beta. When's the last time you won a World Tour sprint? Let's not go down that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow, not bashing. We're his. back. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, Wow, we're not. I was quite. Surprised that he was so selfless with Olaf Koy because he could have won a few of those stages. I think. Are you indirectly implying that Wout Van Aert is selfish? No, he. I mean, <laughs> sometimes a bit, but sometimes not. He was very helpful for Jonas, obviously this year. But yeah, he could have won some of those sprints. He's yeah. not a bad sprinter, but I think the little maneuver they did as well that was quite cheeky and funny, and it yeah. just showed how dominant Jumbo were. They could just literally just. You can't do anything against this. Yeah. 
I remember like they were dominating the Vuelta at that point as well, and I was fully re- ready just to give up cycling for 2023 at that point. <laughs> I was ready to just sign off and just be like, I'll see you guys at Cyclocross. So, I mean, anyway, Jumbo Visma, uh, when you look at it, 59 victories so far, and this, oh, I'm sure there's going to be more in the world uh, in the Vuelta Espana coming up, the GC as well. P Quick Step, I would probably say, had 70 wins, but that didn't include multiple stages in the Tour de France, multiple stages in the Welter, well, multiple, but like a Welter, a Giro, a Tour in there. Are Yumbo too strong for the sport? I mean, Formula One, you always talk about like the dominance killing the sport, but yeah, okay, uh, let's just say it as well. Sepp Kuss, best domestic in the world. Primoz Roglic, multiple uh, Tour de uh, Welter Espana winner. Podium on every single Grand Tour. Jonas Vingo, the two time Tour de France champion. So it's not like it's just random riders. It is the creme de la creme that he kind of brought to this team. And like we said, there's only really Tadabagacha who could, we think, could fight these guys, considering Remco Venable had his off day. Ayuso's like 21, one well to under his his uh, belt so are they too strong and is it bad for the sport when we consider the overall picture that they're dominating everything winning the tour of britain winning the world's espana okay they didn't win the montreal and quebec race but they came close almost with laporte i've got to admit i am not enjoying yumbo visma's dominance in the sport right now i think i'm not the only one saying that i've seen that dotted around quite a lot and you know what i had the same opinion when Sky were doing it back in the 2010s before people decide to go and rebuttal me with that in the comments section. I see you all there, ready, with your comments. Right, I thought exactly the same there. I just don't like it when there's dominance by one team. And I think the fact that, yeah, Jumbo would just have just been so dominant, I don't really like it. Is it bad for the sport? I don't know. I think it's a bit of both. I think it's not good because it just... It's just like a clean sweep by one team. Um, in a lot of cases, the one respite being that Wout Van Aert doesn't win as many one-day races as perhaps he should do. That's something. But it's also good because, you know, it gives that kind of focus for new people to rally around. It's that kind of Galactico team who people are like, oh, I can support this team, even though, yeah, whatever, supporting in cycling. So, I don't know. I think it's good and bad. Um, but I just think that as somebody who's watched the sport for a bit, like over a decade, I'm currently not enjoying it too much. But yeah, that's that's kind of my soft way of explaining it, I guess, but without causing an absolute crash in the comments. In sport, a lot of the time it is based off your natural strength. This is a team that is genuinely the best in, in the sport. They they get the best out of their talents. They push the boundaries. I mean, whether it's diet plans, whether it's clothing, whether it's all this, they do stuff that is different to the teams and it definitely pays off. UAE is the only team that really comes close. And I still feel like UAE are a little bit maverick at points, but they definitely have the talent to uh, to rival them. Uh, in the World Tour points, I mean, UAE have kind of shown that they can rival them. But in terms of those big victories, Yumbo Visma just seemed to scoop them up in a way. And this year, I think they've really stepped up to the plate with the with the three Grand Tour victories they're probably going to get, with 99.9% sure that they are going to get. It definitely shows that they are the strongest. I don't think we should penalize them just because they're so talented. But we don't have all these teams sort of fighting for a bit like in 2019, where it was a little bit more sort of a, a, a free-for-all. Now it seems like we really do have like a sort of bipolar world. <laughs> It's like it's like the Cold War, where we have like UAE and Yumbo Visma really pushing at it. And Yumbo Visma just seem to be dominating that little bit more at the moment. I think it could definitely change in the years to come. But what is worrying, I mean, what is worrying in terms of the sort of the health of cycling democracy is the fact that Yumbo Visma's development team is disgustingly good. And yeah, I was going to make that point like, as well. Because like Sky, Ineos, they never really had the official, we've talked about that quite a long time, and they really 
do snap up the talents we saw it last year they had guys on the podium in the total of an air so like they are pushing the guys forward and when you look at it Seb Kuss when they snapped him up from Radley was not a world beater Jonas Vingo was kind of snapped up because of an incredible KOM performance down in Spain well one of the factors and then you had like Primus Roglic he was uh, winning the tour of Azerbaijan for a Conti team before he was snapped up so they're not by okay what with an art was probably the biggest talent but like look at the ones they're bringing in Dillamon Ball Wilco Kelderman from their rival teams they're letting these guys go and now they're just kind of domestic roles or like semi leaders sometimes but the other teams are letting these incredible riders go to Yomba Visma which is insane when you think about it but that's like Team Sky almost in like the mid 2000s exactly yeah right? look at the 2012 Team Lando Sky mm. you had Mick Rogers a uh, top 10 finisher you had Richie Port oh, it just gets crazy Matteo Jorgensen's moving over to the squad and he said actually in a really interesting interview this week that he'd rather work for a leader than finish eighth and and he actually he understood and acknowledged the fact that people were annoyed that he was going to the Umber Visma to the big, like, super team mega god of the sport almost. The formation of his team hasn't been like you guys were saying about kind of where the, the main guys have come from. There hasn't been an overnight development, it's been in the pipeline for quite a while. You know, like you're saying, like Roglic, like Jonas, like Kuss, like this wasn't a team which was dominating five years ago even like it really kind of came about like you remember like 2017 i remember roglic winning a stage of the tour going over the galibier then 2018 he finished fourth and he was kind of like their focus point and it's really built over the years and like you said you and that kind of swap over point where yumba visma and uae were really competitive against each other was really good i feel like this year the fact that pagacha obviously had that focus on one day races and therefore wasn't as dominant in the tour because of his lack, lack of well the impaired preparation maybe that sort of exemplified this yumbo dominance and you know maybe the tour would have been a bit closer and perhaps we would have been a bit mentally more refreshed about this yumbo visma dominance right now if pagacha was a little bit more competitive during the tour but the thing that gives <laughs> solace to me is that sky's dominance didn't last forever and therefore yumbo visma will cease to dominate at some point you know them and uae like you're saying you and they're just bashing heads right now but you know i i i live for the the cycling i know a lot of people do where it's kind of like the, the underdog wins and i'm kind of wanting a bit more about i think that's why there's quite a lot of support for remco actually right now despite his quite polarizing opinion people are quite liking supporting remco now just because he doesn't have that big team support and he is just on a different team to the two super teams and therefore he is touted as an underdog in that sense i think the dominance right now is just it'll end at some point it might be years from now but i reckon it'll it'll stop eventually other teams will catch up i hope um, that's the thing that keeps me going. Would you intervene though? Because, like in basketball, they have this thing where you have a cost cap, so oh, you can only have yeah. one big star in I'd your team. Intervene. But cycling is so fragile with money and sponsors, and yeah, going up and down. And BMC never happens anymore, etc. But in cycling, money is not very transparent. Like we don't know how much people are getting paid. Like, for instance, at Ash Desert Citroën, Bernard Cosnefroy is fairly likely to be one of the top three most paid people at, at that squad. Like, I, I think it's hard to sort of forecast a future where we can actually see that legitimately being put in place. And we've had such wealth divides in cycling before, and I think that is only going to continue. And with Yumba Visma, there's a certain Saudi urban development problem project that is rumored to be joining the team next year uh, to take over the mantle of Yumbo as title sponsor and we know what happens usually when middle eastern millionaires get involved in sports teams it really that probably is. means that the dominance is going to continue i mean go back to what you were saying scott yeah i would you know if, if cycling does continue in this way and more sponsorship does come in maybe because people see maybe i don't know somehow seeing it being more of a promising avenue for sponsorship. I would like to see more of a cap on stuff because like, otherwise we're just going to be ending up with just a decade of one team dominating. And 
Like, nobody wants that. Like, I don't care if you're the most diehard Jumbo Visma fan. If you're a fan of cycling, you, you will not want a team, just one team dominating for, for a decade because that's just it's just no fun, is it? To be honest with you, it's predictable and cycling isn't designed to be a predictable sport. It's designed for panache and, you know, those gusto moves and hopefully we kind of r- retain that a little bit uh, moving forwards with the sport. 2031 when Jonas Vingo wins his 10th Tour de France title. No, no one? Okay, just me then. I would be fine with that. Um, but yeah, we might as well move on. There's other races on the agenda as well. The We alluded to it, Quebec and Montreal. Montreal just finishing as we're literally recording, seeing Adam Yates beating Pavel Sivakov of Ineos Grenadiers. So the super team thing continues but in the other one Quebec we saw Anna Delis take a very hectic final sprint what did you guys make of that were you just gonna say you and that Sivakov's gonna be joining you he next year and therefore it's kind of like the dominance continues do you guys think that Delis win at Quebec equals the four stage wins of Koi I think that oh, I don't know it's so hard to say because it's such a, it's the biggest stage there's bigger riders there but Koi got it's four wins man it's a lot in a non-world tour race against a limited world tour field that is true guys it's a different segment you and stop bashing tour Britain here we had that <laughs> but no <laughs> just throwing grenades but in this one as well delete i think that it was genuinely very very important like the way he won it was just phenomenal like it's one of those wins where like i'm really relieved because he's been missing that world tour victory and now he's finally got it and it's off his back now and he can f- focus on next year and really hitting like omelette and news blood and probably can't wavel him and trying to win those races next year the least the real deal lotto destiny have done a really good job this weekend in the quebec classics and yeah i'm super excited to see where he's going to go soon and it's not even like a world tour victory where it's oh it's a tour of polonia sprint it's like big one day race against big riders so it's like massive kudos to delay from coming from way downtown and freaking just pipping everyone like not even like rubbish riders like full-on hitters Michael Matthews, Corbin Strong, Laporte, just all the guys just got absolutely gassed. And it was it was pretty sick, not gonna lie. Do you think oh you said both of you he's the real deal? Is he now well we've I think one of our first episodes was about Dilly as well, where he absolutely smoked Mess Pilterson on a on a profile that would have suited him well, Mess Pilterson completely. Is he just like Christoph? Two point, well, three point here. I think now in hindsight, we almost hyped him up a little bit too much at the beginning of the season. But I think it was understandable. No, you, you yeah. got cr- you yeah, crashed yeah, yeah, as well. He, so yeah, it's not our fault. and he was uh, not his fault. Really, really good. It just missing the, the that world tour win. But I think with the lead, what is going to be interesting is how he develops as a rider because he's great at these hilly sprints. He can also hit the flat sprints, and he can do the, these cobblestone classics. He is super versatile. Christoph and Pearson are very similar, but I'd say like a kind of like Pearson type of the wildcard sprinter. But I think Delee's a little bit more reliable than than Pearson. Why did Delee not go to the tour this year? Was he injured or something? Or was he just he, not selected? I think, well, he crashed out of Dunkirk, yeah, which was in May. I, think I so, didn't yeah. think he came back. Yeah. I mean, he's only 21. So it's like he's going to be one of the most crazy 22, 21 year olds. Yeah. To and, arrive. And they had Caleb Ewan. That's true. I mean, Delee was well. literally, Delee was forged in the UCI relegation battle of having to go and dominate UCI sprints at the age of like 19. Like he was literally forged out of fire trying to save Lotto Sidhal. I mean, he could, he could literally be one of the main driving forces towards towards them getting back into the World Tour eventually, maybe. I mean, Lotto Zadal are a different force this year. If they were like this last year, they were being world beaters. How many stages, how many races have they won this year? It's just been crazy. It's done them well, this relegation. 17 victories already. And Mm -hmm. I mean, last year, they couldn't almost, well, okay, 25 victories, but yeah, most of them, courtesy of Dilly. (laughs) 
most of the victories this year as well high level they've managed yeah. to podium world tour races they've really stepped up their game last year the De Lee was their biggest point scorer it's a 19 year old now this year i mean Dali's probably the biggest point scorer but they have plenty of other, other riders who are right up there who really stepped up to the plate and to be honest lotto destiny should be the number one people to make a bag i know it's in two years time but then to return back to the world tour level I welcome it with open arms. And the transfers they're making as well throughout the offseason, they're pointing towards sort of consolidating uh, their status next year. In terms of what we saw with Ram Kravinopol, his off day, what do you guys think this will, how will this affect him in terms of a Tour de France next year, a Giro in the future? Is he the big juggernaut that can dethrone a Jumbo Visma or do you think it might hamper him? As a GC rider, to be winning, like you really can't be having any of those like at all to be honest with you not on that level i mean the reason behind him doing it was or not feeling that great is still seems largely unknown even by the team i can't remember there's been a lot of different reasons going around but i feel like remco yeah he can't be doing that in the tour otherwise he ain't he ain't winning even like the tt does still kind of help him like he will still gain time on the other riders like he he proved that um, this time round. Thing is, having a stronger team isn't going to help him in that scenario. It's literally just he needs to be better at not having those big off days, whatever that is. Maybe it's because he did world champs and he needed to kind of do a peak for that. And then maybe that wasn't perfect preparation for the Vuelta. But of course, this was a very unprecedented year for the Super World Champs. So maybe that won't, that won't happen next time round. What will happen for the tour, at least. I, think I will that... just point out. Uh, Ewan did point out that this detour to Sterling Glasgow was something that everyone else wasn't doing. Yeah. And I mean, where mm. are we now? Yeah, that's very Remco, true. you should be listening. <laughs> Us, the echelon. Because he got through the whole world to last time without having a cataclysmic day. And therefore it makes me believe that he can do it again. But I feel like maybe this was just a, a one-off. But I don't know, maybe he's just got to get lucky and get through a Grand Tour without having one of his off days. And maybe that's just a factor of chance more than ability. He just seems to run into these off days so often. Like, we spoke about it in the build-up to, I mean, we to the Swiss, to the, the Vuelta, like, that these off days seem to, they were Remco's, Remco's kryptonite over the past couple of years, and it seemed like he fixed that over the past 12 months. And now we return to this point once again where he's, just slipping up and losing a bunch of time on one day. I don't know what he can do to sort of remedy this. It seemed like he was remedying it where he was going through stage races without big wobbles. Maybe he needs to go into higher class use to go well to stage races next year in order to prepare like Paris Nice, for instance, and Dauphiné for, and Romandy just to sort of throw himself into those situations where the caliber of racing warming up into a Grand Tour is higher and he doesn't experience these these sort of off days. But g- given the current evidence we have, I'm not 100% sure that he can really go into next year's Tour de France as an outstanding favorite. I think Vingo and Pogacar are just on a different level to, to him. And yes, he has an advantage in the TTs. But, but Vingo and Pogacar have shown over the past couple of years that they equally are really, really good time trialists when they're at that fully fit form at the Tour de France. Maybe Remco will, will bring that once he's there, but I just don't think that that's enough of a USP to set him apart from Vingo and Pogacar, particularly in those high mountain stages. I just think they're going to smoke him. Yeah, you're right. Because even if like Jonas and Primoz are 90, 95% of the time trialist that Remco is, but then they, you know, put minutes into them in the mountains. It doesn't matter how good your TT is because at the end of the day, the GC is largely forged in the mountains. The GC kind of battle in the TT is really just kind of a cherry on top of the cake and it's more like it's not the main, you know, it's 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 like it's like your Christmas dinner. The TT is like the peas at the side. Whereas the mountains well, are like you've just the lost turkey. the entire following here because uh, no 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 no, no how many Brits we have here this just go on then sense. go on it does because the, then the mountains are like everything else it's like your turkey your roast potatoes your mashed potatoes and your gravy that's like everything else and then the TT is just like a little bit at the side which is like a nice to have but 
you know, it's not crucial. And I hope people appreciate that. So Ewan has Beyonce singing contest. You, food. Okay, well, this is going to be our very famous clip before as well with Roglic where we said he would never win the Tour de France. And I mean, that comment section was quite funny. We, we stand yet to be corrected on that. Yeah, I mean, do you think Remco will ever win a Tour de France now? He is younger than Tad Bogaccia and Jonas Bingo. Before anyone just attacks us in the comments, we know how good Remco is. A welter winner, now two-time world champion in two different disciplines. Three times San Sebastian Classic winner. Tour of Denmark winner as well, crucially. Tour of Tad Bogaccia and Bingo, I've never done that. And uh, yeah, very, very great one-day racer. But it is different, a Tour de France compared to a Vuelta España. Roglic has won three of them, never won the Tour. So Chris Horner's won the Welter, never won the Tour. Is he ever going to win it? I don't think he's going to be a serial champion. I'm not talking about frosted flakes. I'm talking about like winning three, four Tour de France's. Like we've seen with like Vingago. Well, we will probably see with Vingago. And we, we could see with, with Pogaccia. I don't think Ava de Paul's going to win like three, four. Maybe one Will or he two. win one? Will he win one? One. We're just asking for I one. Feel like- I feel like he will win one. Like he's shown enough promise to win at least one. I'm just so I'm so tired of having this Will Remco win the Tour de France discussion when he hasn't even bleeping ra- raced it before. Like, you know? Could have done it this year. Yeah, could have done it this year. I concur. Especially I, now. I, I do think that he will win. Like the stars have to align once. Like a cuss. The stars will align once, at least. Plenty of years on his side. I'd be surprised if he didn't win one. He he is good enough. He does produce. Well, enough yeah, lots. obviously. Like he he does beat these guys. He has beaten these guys already in this race. He just needs to remove this random five minute, six minute loss days somehow, and then he'll be all right. When's he beaten Pocky? When's he ever beaten Jonas? Yeah. He beat, beat Jonas up that sprint where he smacked his face into a reporter. Yeah, but that's not beating him. That's beating him on one that, stage. That, 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 I'm sorry. That... Yon- Remco came first and Jonas came second. That's the definition of... Beat. Yeah, how's it going now? Like, let's check the GC right now. How's it but going? It's, it's, it's not about... It's not, I said he did. I'm not saying he's doing it now. I'm just saying that he yeah, but has You can't him. just... That's like saying he beat him on a... Well, okay, no, that's not the same thing. But, like, it's not like winning on a stage race or something like that. They're stage races. They're not... Okay, can I just say, Remco Avenapol has started four Grand Tours. Only one has really come with grapefruit, you know? With, like, winning the race overall and the Vuelta last year. The Giro 2021. Not great. We don't talk about that. Welter victory, Gino this year. That, this y- Welter. Yeah. Oh. There was context though to that one. It's like coming back from almost dying and then first yeah. race is the Giro. Bit weird in hindsight, Patrick Lefebvre, but yeah. But then well, this is a guy who's ha- who has a hit rate of 25%. He was going to win the Giro this year. To be fair, yeah. He was he very strong was. this year. He fully was. I think Remco fully has the potential. And he will win. It's just that for some reason he just has these weird, stupid things that a weird random day, a COVID, a crash or whatever, always seems to get him down and just needs to get lucky and just get through all those just just once. Only 23. Just pointing that out. Yeah, exactly. Jonas is, is like literally a granddad in comparison to him, basically. You know, he like is he's a dad. He's, he li- is yeah, dad. basically. There you go. No, but he is a dad. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Outerbrooks is like his little son, in a way. That's true. We'll come back next year. Well, yeah, come back next year for us talking about will Outerbrooks win the Tour de France? Well, it's been quite a long episode. We might as well go to Rider of the Week here, unless there was anything else that people could think about. Obviously, there are some races that we probably haven't covered. Um, but yeah, Rider of the Week for 33. Episode 33. I will kick it off with a pretty basic one, but I'll say Sepkus 
as my rider of the week for being... You picked him last week. Did I? No, I picked Danny Van Poppel last week. Oh, did, you... <laughs> did you even pick him last week? I picked Chris last week. Oh, well, oh, okay. we got back same to thing. back. I trigger you in. They look the same. <laughs> back to back, back <laughs> for rider of the week. I don't know. He just seemed very New unflappable. I, I literally, he, he's just running out of superfluous. Like, he's he's just insane in this welter. And the fact that he was, like, still dominant at the top of a tourmalay, oh, just insane. So, yeah, Sepkus, chapeau to him. I wouldn't be surprised if we're coming back next week and we're saying that he's the winner. We didn't really talk too much about that. Why are we not winning the Tour of Britain second time in a row? Still That's... warrants a bit of mention. I think that was pretty cool. Second time mm. in a row, asterisk. Don't forget that Queen. No, not in a row. Not in a row. No one's going for Olaf Koy. Four stages in a. Fine, That's... fine, 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 fine. I'm gonna do it, Olaf Koy. I know, I know, I completely poo pooed Tour Britain, but four four wins in one week. That's not bad. Yeah, I'm gonna go for Rumko Venepol because he had a incredible, aggressive nature, and he's back in the Pocoro jersey. So I, I really. I really did admire that and the panache of doing that incredible attack where he destroyed Roman Bade and everyone else. So anyways, uh, we might as well. We did predictions last week as well. So we've done right of the week. I pick Remco, etc. But in terms of who's going to be in the red jersey, who do you think it's going to be? Essentially, who's going to win the welter? That's the prediction now here in, on the second rest day. That because... Oh, okay. I'll save in goal. It won't happen now. All right, well, well I say, I'll say Roglic then, then we complete the trifecta. Yay! But anyways, that's it for our 33rd episode. Yes, I am still counting. Almost 100. Yeah, make sure to comment down below, get involved in the conversation, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel here on the Echelon Cycling Podcast. And of course, as always, thank you for watching and we will see you around.